Well, I'm delighted to be here with you, and I'm uh, very impressed by this crowd. I expected most of you would be on your way home, and uh, I was going to make some clever comment about the remaining ones being the select of the elect, but um, <laughs> there goes that intro. Uh, normally, I attack Chris Larson for uh, giving me a terrible title, but I have a good title. And, uh, but I haven't been able to decide whether I'm batting cleanup or batting ninth. I think uh, probably I'm batting ninth, but uh, it's delightful to be here with you and uh, uh, to speak on a, a rather neglected subject, I think. Um, it's curious that to this day in many parts of Europe, Ascension Day, a Thursday, is a public holiday. Uh, but in America, Ascension Day has never been particularly observed or noticed, except amongst the Dutch Reformed. Um, <laughs> uh, we have, uh, of course, focused greatly on the cross, greatly on the resurrection of our Lord, significantly on Pentecost, but somehow uh, Ascension has often somewhat got lost in the shuffle. And yet I hope as we think about it together, we'll be able to see it's a very important, very timely, very helpful subject and uh, helps us to think about one of the more curious things that Jesus ever said. I have thought that a whole new line of books could be written by R.C. Sproul on the topic, what are the hardest things to believe in the Bible? And, and one of the sad things about the world as it looks at the Bible is it almost always gets radically wrong what are the hard things to believe in the Bible. They always look at things that are easy for the creator of heaven and earth to do and claim those are hard to believe. The sun standing still, how can the maker of the sun not make the sun stand still if he wants to? It's not hard to believe. But there are hard things to believe in the Bible. When Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, that can be hard to believe. When Paul says, all things work together for good, that can be hard to believe. When Jesus said to his disciples in John 16, it is to your advantage that I go away. They must have found that hard to believe. It's advantageous that Jesus should go away? How can that be? What sense does that make? How can we believe that? Wouldn't it have been much better if Jesus had stayed with us? Well, the New Testament teaching about the ascension helps answer that question. In his going away, he ascended into glory. And in his ascended glory, he gave gifts to men. And that was to our advantage. Now, when we think about the ascension, I think often our minds go to the end of Luke's gospel and the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, because they're the historic events of the ascension are described for us, or perhaps our minds go to John chapters 14 through 16, where Jesus is preparing His disciples for His departure and talks about the sending of the Spirit. Those would be great places to go, but I want to go someplace different with you to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Uh, because in preparing for this address, it it came to me in a way that I had never really thought about it before, that Ephesians in one sense can be seen as an extended meditation, reflection, and application of the doctrine of the ascension to the lives of Christian people. And I hope as we go along you'll begin to see what I mean by that. But I think a big part of what motivated Paul to write to the Ephesians and shapes the way in which he wrote to the Ephesians is perhaps some of the struggles of faith that they were having 
struggles of faith very parallel to the struggles of faith we may be having. Namely, this question, is becoming a Christian a gain or a loss? Now, you're all pious. You know the right answer to that question. But nonetheless, at a deep, heartfelt level, Christians at various times and in various ways struggle with that question. By becoming a Christian, I have lost certain things in this world. And is that a net loss or a net gain? And Paul is writing to these Ephesians to try to, in quoting a governor of California, pump them up. (laughs) He's trying to encourage them to see how wonderfully, how gloriously being a Christian is gain. Now, if we could put ourselves back imaginatively into the situation of those Ephesians, we might be able to understand a little bit why they might have been tempted to think that they have lost a great deal in becoming Christians. Some of you may have been privileged, as I was, to visit Ephesus. Ephesus is a great place to visit because it's one of the better preserved ruins from the ancient Roman world. And Ephesus is basically built up the side of a hill. Um, Many parts of the country they called a mountain, but in California we called it a hill. Up the side of a hill, and the main street of Ephesus kind of curves down this hill, and most tour group buses drop tourists at the top of the hill so that to aged and infirm as we are, we can make our way downhill instead of uphill. And you walk past the ruins of various shops and homes and other sorts of establishments, but as you come down towards the bottom of the hill, you pass the beautiful facade remaining of the great library of Ephesus. And then if you continue on down that road, you come to a very well-preserved amphitheater where Paul actually preached. And then if you lift your eyes and look to the left, if you're facing the same direction I am, um, you see in the distance the port of Ephesus the source of a great deal of the city's wealth and influence. And then if you look straight ahead beyond the uh, amphitheater, about a mile away, there's one lone pillar still standing. All that still stands of the great temple of Artemis, Artemis of the Ephesians, uh, a great source of both wealth and pride to the city. The temple of Artemis, about a mile out of town, uh, was the largest temple building in the ancient world in the Mediterranean, four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens, a huge building, a source of huge pride to the Ephesians. And you think about that for a moment, Um, the pride they could have in their wealth flowing through the port bringing trade from inland cities, the pride they could have in their political influence being well connected with the Romans, the pride they could have in their educational accomplishments with this great library there in their city, and the pride they could have in their religion uh, and this great temple which was a source of tourists visiting and pilgrims visiting even then in the ancient world. And it must have been really something for a citizen of that city to be able to say, I am an Ephesian. That means I'm an inheritor of culture and wealth and influence and significance and magnificent buildings that attest to our importance in the world. 
And now, all of a sudden, the converts in Ephesus feel cut off, feel alienated, completely alienated from some aspects of the city, certainly alienated from the great temple of Artemis. Perhaps they've lost jobs because of their Christian commitments. Perhaps they've been shunned by family and neighbors. In any case, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to realize that the small Christian community in Ephesus would have had every reason to begin to wonder, have I lost more than I've gained? And part of what Paul is doing here, a significant part of what Paul is doing here in Ephesians is saying, no, you have gained much more than you've lost. And that helps account for the really extravagant language that Paul uses in the letter to the Ephesians about who we are as Christians, the richness of our inheritance in Christ. The fact that we possess the fullness of Him who fills all in all. The fact that Christ is supreme over powers and dominions and authorities. The fact that Christ is building a new city with a new temple, and that we are privileged to be living stones in that temple, and that in a prof profound sense, those privileges that are ours are gifts from the ascended Christ. And that's the point that Paul wants to make. Let me read just a few verses of one of the places where this comes through very clearly. Let me read from Ephesians 1 at verse 16. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of the glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His great might which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And He put all things under His feet and gave Him His head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. He's above every name. And when the Ephesians tried to shout down Paul, saying, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, Paul knew and he taught and he preached that Jesus had a greater name than Artemis. How many followers does Artemis have today? How many followers does Jesus have today? Jesus has more followers in this room today than Artemis does in the world. Uh, and that's the point that, that Paul is developing here as he thinks about what it means that we have an ascended Christ, a Christ who not only died on the cross for our sins, not only was raised from the dead for our justification, but has been ascended and glorified in heaven, now reigning at the right hand of God, now ensuring that every promise He made to His people will be fulfilled. No promise will fail because no power can oppose Him in the accomplishing of His purpose. And so the first point I want us to, to see here in this text is the glory attributed to Christ by Paul here in the Ephesians 
letter, the glorious place he now inhabits. He's in the heavenlies. He's at the right hand of God. He's enthroned there. His enemies, implicitly at least, are under his feet. And he's the head of the church. This is reminding us implicitly that Christ is the fulfillment of Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And that's what Jesus is doing now. That's where Jesus is now. He's enthroned at the right hand of God in heaven, in the heavenly temple. And this is temple language repeated over and over again in this letter. Don't be sad that you can't go to the temple of Artemis anymore. Don't be sad that you can't brag that you are a participant in the biggest temple in the ancient world. Know that you are now part of a spiritual temple that is bigger than any temple any human being could make and is growing all the time with living stones as a dwelling place for God. Not the dwelling place of some dumb image that cannot speak or move or hear. But you are being formed into a spiritual temple as a dwelling place for the living God, the Creator God, the Savior God. That's the glory of what our Christ is doing and what He's doing for you. He's in a glorious place. A glorious place, you notice how this is put, far above every power. Oh, those Romans thought they were pretty good with their seven hills and with a great temple to Jupiter the conqueror on one of the higher hills of Rome. And Paul is saying it doesn't matter how high the hill is, temples to false gods are built. It doesn't matter how great are the powers of this world. Jesus is supreme over them. Jesus stands above them, not just a little above them, far above them. This is a sort of Donald Trump epistle. (laughs) Everything is huge. Everything is great. But it's real. (laughs) Jesus is far above, and there are no powers that can challenge Him. And what that reminded the Ephesians and should remind us is that whether it is obvious to us that the church of Jesus Christ is flourishing or whether it appears to us that the church of Jesus Christ is shrinking and in great danger, Christ is accomplishing His purpose. And in the history of the church, there are good days and bad days. And sometimes in the history of the church, the good days are the bad days, where the church is powerful, where the church is influential, where the church becomes wealthy, all too often the church becomes corrupt and faithless. And where the church has bad days, where there's persecution, and where there seems to be a little growth, and where the church has no worldly goods, I think on the last day we may well discover those were the good days, where there was faithfulness and devotion and commitment. And Paul is saying to these Ephesians, whether there are days of apparent success or of apparent failure, look up, because Christ is reigning. Christ is supreme. Christ is exalted at the right hand of the Father, and He is accomplishing just what He intends to accomplish. 
It's a glorious place. And from that glorious place comes a glorious plenitude, a glorious fullness. It's interesting to read through Ephesians and underline fullness every time you come to it. It's one of the great themes in Ephesians. God fills Christ. Christ fills the world. Christ fills the church for the world. And what is this fullness all about? What does this fullness really mean? Well, I think the interpreters who suggest that it really harkens back to Ezekiel are correct. You remember Ezekiel early in his ministry had a vision of the glory lifting up from the temple in Jerusalem and departing. And then towards the end of his ministry, Ezekiel has another vision, and it's a vision promising that the Lord will return in glory to the temple, and the glory of the Lord will fill the temple. And I think Paul is alluding to that prophecy and saying those days are now because Christ is filling His spiritual temple, His people, with His Holy Spirit. And that is the glory of God among us, the Spirit that enlivens us, that empowers us, that gives us the gift of faith, that enables us to look beyond the visible to the invisible where Christ is glorious. And enables Paul to write that Jesus is head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Where do you want, look if you want to see the fullness of Christ? Now. Where is the fullness of Christ displayed now? Paul says, in the church. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, he means some beautiful building built in the 16th century. No? This is a tough crowd. This is a tough crowd. What is the church where the fullness of Christ dwells? It's the people of God, the faithful people of God, gathered around God's Word, gathered in God's way. That's where we see Christ. And it's often not a picture of success as the world would count success, but it's a picture of changed lives. I don't know very many of you very well. You don't look great. And if I knew some of you better, I might think, boy, you have a long way to go. <laughs> but what I always encourage people to think about is, um, you may have a long way to go, but how far have you come? Are you different from what you would have been without Christ? We are a changed people. Thankfully, we're a justified people, so perfect in God's sight but we're also a sanctified people. We're a changed people. Christ by His Spirit has made us different. And, and that difference, Christ says, should be manifested in the world, can be seen in the world. We're not as good as we should be. We're not as good as we will be. But we're different. And there ought to be a character of love in the Christian community that shines in a dark world. That's why it's important to think about the glorified Christ more than we think about how things are going to rack and ruin. Because if we only think about how things are going to rack and ruin, we will be inclined to become an angry people. Now, there's plenty to be angry about, but we shouldn't be an angry people. We should be a loving people who holds up in the day of salvation the cross of Christ, and says to sinners, no matter what your sin, no matter how bad your sin, there's forgiveness at the cross in Christ. 
And that's the fullness of Him who fills all in all. What a glory, a glorious place, a glorious plenitude, a glorious power. Notice how that's described in any number of ways, verse 19 of chapter 1. What is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe? Immeasurable, incalculable greatness of power. That does not mean He will do everything the way we want Him to do it. We all have a list of things we're too pious to say this, but we all have a list of things where we may secretly think this would be a better way of doing things, God. But what Paul is reminding us is we have a God who is so wise and so good at the same time that He has immeasurable power that He's always doing it right and we trust that. Even when we can't see it, we can trust that. He's accomplishing His purpose. He's building His church. He's glorifying Himself. There's there's a splendor displayed here for us. And so when we look at politics and get discouraged, or we look at our culture and we get discouraged, We look at economics and we get discouraged. We look at great universities and get discouraged. We look at religion and get discouraged. Paul says, look up to the immeasurable greatness of the power of Christ who is accomplishing His purpose and building His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, this isn't to say that we shouldn't do careful cultural analysis and try to understand what's going on. And as a historian, I I look back and I think, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that we are where we are as Americans today when for decades there has been a steady anti-Christian drumbeat in many of the universities, in much of the media, and in much of the entertainment of our land, deriding Christianity, ignoring Christianity, mocking Christianity, denying Christianity, denying Christian values, dismissing it as bourgeois prejudices. And we could get mad about that. But Paul says, none of them can stand against our Christ. None of them can take one elect soul out of His hand. And we may face trying days. But be assured, Christian, that Christ has promised that He is using all of His glorious power for the sake of His church to accomplish His purpose in it. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that hopeful? And part of the glorious accomplishment of His power is that He has established a glorious peace for us. His people, peace between man and God. Again, it's, it's remarkable how Paul expresses the making of peace. Look, for example, in chapter 2 of Ephesians, verses 14 through 16, for he, that is Jesus, himself is our peace, who has made us both one, that is Jew and Gentile, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. The cross is a place of death. 
a place of death, of hostility between God and man and between man and man. And it's remarkable that it's only by breaking down and abolishing and killing that Paul says we can have peace. But because Christ has done that, because He's died, because He's raised, because He's ascended to the heavenlies, we do have peace. Peace with God. Peace with one another. Of course, the great Christian message has long been, hasn't it? If, if Jew and Gentile can be reconciled, any human division can be overcome. Dutch Reformed people can learn to like Presbyterians. <laughs> A Welshman can marry an Irish woman. It's staggering the peace that can be created. And of course, that's an essential part of our calling, isn't it? To show that peace, to show that reconciliation, to demonstrate that the greatest truth about us is that we are Christians and we are reconciled to one another. What a glory in the ascended Christ. And then Paul goes on to say, and that ascended Christ, in His ascension, has given gifts to men. That's chapter 4 of Ephesians. Chapter 4, verse 7, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, He ascended on high, He led a host of captives, and He gave gifts to men. This is a quote from Psalm 68. It's always intriguing how Paul knows the Psalter backwards and forwards. And if you go back and check Paul, he slightly misquotes the psalm. Oh, did we just find an error in the Bible? Are you worried? Well, in Psalm 68 at verse 18, the psalmist wrote, You ascended on high. Who's the you there? God. So when Paul applies that psalm to Jesus, what's he saying about Jesus? That he's God. You ascended on high, leading a, hope, a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts from men. The emphasis here is that Christ in his ascension in the first place as a conqueror receives gifts. That's the character of what belongs to a conqueror. When a conqueror overwhelms his enemies, the enemies have to give all that they have to the conqueror. That's what Psalm 68 is celebrating. The Christ in his ascension in the first place received gifts. But then, of course, as the loving Savior, he turns right around and gives gifts to men. Look at the end of Psalm 68, verse 35, awesome is God from His sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to His people. So Paul actually knew Psalm 68, not only the one verse he wanted to quote, but the whole psalm, which talks about not just receiving gifts, but giving gifts. And what are the gifts he gives? Well, you know, there's that glorious, remarkable statement right at the beginning of Ephesians. Verse 3, chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. How many spiritual blessings do you have? 
Well, Paul says, every one that Christ has to give. He has showered you with gifts. He has showered you with blessings. And he's not only done that, but he's seated you with Christ in the heavenlies. Now, I'm not sure I know exactly all the dimensions of that. But that's what the apostle says. You are seated now in the heavenlies with Christ. Look at uh, Ephesians 2 verse 6. And He raised us up with Him. You know that, don't you? That in the resurrection of Christ, you were raised if you believe in Him. And raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We share now, not only in the cross and in the resurrection, but we share now in the ascension. And at the very least, what that means is your most essential citizenship is in heaven. Doesn't matter whether you're an Ephesian or a Roman or an American. Your most essential citizenship is in heaven because that's where you're seated. That's your home country. That's your true temple. That's your true Lord. What a gift that we should be seated with the Savior in glory. And He's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit to lead us into truth. And then He's given us the gift of preachers. As a preacher, I feel pretty good about that. (laughs) I don't know if you're all that excited. But you see, this is is an expression of how Christ cares for His church, how Christ is the head of the church, how Christ in the church is filling all in all, because He does not leave the church without the truth. And preachers bring the truth if they're faithful to their calling. And what is their calling? Not to offer their opinions, but to bring the Word of God. And that's what Paul is laying out here in such wonder, in such extravagance, really. Christ has given you such great gifts, blessings the Spirit, preachers to tell you the truth. And the fruit of that is faith and grace and love and growing maturity. Paul talks about that in Ephesians 4 and 5. It's really worth reading with care. One of the blessings of the Spirit is that we don't have to remain children not knowing what our do, we're doing, not knowing what we should believe, cast about by every wind of doctrine. But one of the gifts of Christ is that we can be growing into the stature of the fullness of Christ. So in knowing Jesus, did you gain or did you lose? You lost a temple that's now in ruins. You lost a city that's now abandoned. You lost an empire that's been defunct a long time. And you gained a savior and a citizenship and an assurance and every spiritual blessing. I think you're doing pretty well. Let's pray. Father, we are amazed at how glorious our Savior is and how His ascension testifies and shows us and displays before us His victory. But how thankful we are that in victory He cares for His people. In victory He gives gifts and provides for His own. And so we rejoice that we have a Savior who will never leave us or forsake us, but will one day 
return in visible glory to make a new heaven and a new earth where every tear is wiped away and righteousness dwells. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.